Welcome to our review of Aldabas, Doors of Cartagena, a tableau building game with a unique theme. Thank you, Mark from Grand Gamers Guild for sending a copy of this game up our way. Now, Aldabas, Doors of Cartagena, which we're just going to be calling Aldabas for the rest of this review, was designed by Nathan, sorry, Nathaniel Levin and Joshua J. Mills. It features artwork from Josh Capel and Juan David Vargas. And it was published just this year by Grand Gamers Guild after a rather successful Kickstarter. So about that, the copy of Aldabas we are reviewing tonight is the Kickstarter edition of the game. Mm -hmm. The thing is, currently this is the only edition of the game that is out there. So if you go out and buy a copy right now, say direct from Grand Gamers Guild, or even from an online game store like Game Nerds, this is the version of the game you are getting. Right now, as things stand, there's only one version of Aldabas, but we wanted to call that out and make it clear in case there ever is a retail version re uh, released after this review goes live. Now, Aldabas is a tableau building card game that plays one to four players with games taking well under an hour. Currently, you can grab Aldabas for $29.99 US right from Grand Gamers Guild, an extremely reasonable price. The game Aldabas is based on the real-world city of Cartagena in Colombia, where historically people adorned their doors with elegant door knockers that represent the occupation and social status of the occupants. For example, you will find lions on the doors of people who were in the military. These door knockers are called Aldabas, which is where the game gets its name from. Now, mechanically, Aldabas is a tableau building card game where you will build a 3x4 city block of doors from various occupations. Each card has an effect when played and also triggers the cards beside it. At the end of the round, players will add up their influence for each occupation type, and players with the highest and second highest influence in each will score points for a variety of different things based on what's in their tableau, their vault, and their hand. There's also points awarded for banking coins and having the most influence overall. Now for a look at what you get in the box for Aldabas, including the rather striking card art, I invite you to check out our Aldabas unboxing video on YouTube. Where you get to see me get rather confused by the whole Kickstarter and non-Kickstarter thing all over again. Now the most notable thing here is the cards, uh, both how many you get. This is a sizable deck of cards that you will not go through in a single gameplay in most cases. Um, and the composition of the cards. These are some of the thickest card game cards I've ever handled. And honestly, they're actually difficult to shuffle based on how thick and sturdy they are, which honestly is a great sign for their long-term durability, though I wish they were just a touch thinner. Yeah, we played this for the first time on a night with a number of other card games, and it was shocking how thick mm -hmm. and stiff compared to the other decks that we'd already shuffled that night. I'm pretty good at a big, thick, you know, heavy deck riffle shuffle, but it was giving me a workout. Now, along with the cards, you get a thin card vault that also acts as a rule reference, wooden coins, 12 per player, and a punch board with a handful of additional coins, scoring markers, and a two-part dock slash score tracker. Uh, the rules are very clear with lots of examples, and I had no problem with them at all. Note, if there is ever a retail version of, Al of Aldabas, the coins will be cardboard. Mm -hmm. The other thing we got in our Kickstarter is a small new professions expansion that ex includes 27 new cards in three suits and a two page rule sheet. Now, overall, I was happy with everything that came in the box, except one thing, the vaults. These thin cards just didn't work very well for what they were intended to do, which is to hide cards and coins, especially because the coins in this edition are thick wooden coins. After our first game, I'll admit, I stole some vault screens from another one of my games and used that to hide our information when we played. As for what you need those vaults for, I think it's time to move on to an overview of play. Okay, I'm going to go with the base game rules for saving the new professions and solo play to talk about after. So you set up the game by placing the dock in the center of the table, and the two part thing with the wooden dock side up with coin symbol showing and then create a bank of 12 coins per player. Then you're gonna shuffle all the cards and deal everyone a hand of five cards. Players are then gonna pick one card to start their block. This is gonna be placed face down under their vault. And this is the first thing you're gonna be in play. You don't show that to anyone else. 
Now, all future card plays are going to build off this corner card. Players can then discard any number of the other cards they got from their hand, and if they do, they get one car coin for each card discarded. Once everyone's ready, you then flip over cards from the deck until the dock is filled, which is a total of five cards. That's it. This is not a game with long setup time, though I will note picking what card to start with isn't an easy choice and is even more difficult your first play when you don't really know what all these cards do. Yeah, that's very true, unfortunately. There is a lot of iconography in this game, and it's not very clear what everything means until you actually see it and play and use it. Now, thankfully, the vault does have a pretty good reference on the back of it. And what I suggest is for your first few games, or possibly all of your games, just play with that side of the vault face up. Now, each turn in all the boss players are going to take two actions, which are chosen from three options. These two actions can be the same or different options. Note two actions. We actually got that wrong when we played early on sitting down to play and that badly impacted our initial mm -hmm. impressions. It's two actions and that's important for this game to work. Yeah, one of the bellhops rules in effect. Your first game of every play is going of any game is going to be extreme no matter how you tried and this was no exception. So here are the options for those two actions. First you can take coins. Take two coins from the bank. That's it. Note, if the coins run out, you can use the cardboard tokens that are also included. Next, you can buy a card from the docks. You take the card you want, and you pay the cost shown above it. You then slide all the cards down into the market to fill the gap and reveal a new card under the most expensive three-coin slot. Note, there are two spots on the dock that don't cost anything. You mm -hmm. don't actually need coins to buy cards. Plus, there are cards you can add to your tableau that can reduce the cost of buying cards. Yep. Now, the last action available to you is to play a card from your hand into your tableau, your growing block. Now, cards must be placed to the right or above existing cards, so you build outward. You also can't place two doors of the same color next to each other. Now, when you do play a card, you are going to activate that card's ability, as well as the abilities of the cards to the side and below the one you just played. Each of the different professions in the game do something unique. And, have, and some professions have cards at different influence levels that each have their own abilities. Mm. There's far too much to deep dive here. Check out the written review for that. But as for some examples, soldier cards let you move coins both into your vault or onto your cards in your tableau as additional influence. Uh, fisheries get you resources like coins and cards. Nobles get you points or enhance your soldiers. Clergy let you vault cards, and builders let you buy cards at a discount. Now, it's learning what these different abilities are and why you would want to do them and how they combo together that's really the meat of this game. And honestly, it's the hardest part of learning how to play all the bus. Honestly, it's a challenge. Even with the vault reference in front of you, there are a lot of things to keep in mind, and I strongly doubt too many groups can avoid messing things up their first several plays, not because they aren't good players, but because there's just a lot going on. Yeah. Now, play continues around the table with each player taking two actions until one of three things happens. Either the door deck runs out. We've yet to have that happen. The coin supply runs out. That happens often. Or a player fills his block or her block with a 12th card. In this case, every player, other than the player that triggered the end, gets one more turn. Now we get to scoring, which is rather unique and also has a bit of a learning curve. So first off, everyone's going to get two points for every coin they put in their vault. You then take these coins and put them to the rest of your coins considered your purse. Then everyone's going to reveal any cards in their bank, including that first initial card that was put face down, as well as any cards that you then banked later using the clergy uh, profession cards. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Starting with the soldiers and working through each suit, each different profession, everyone's going to add up their total influence of that suit. Now, every card has an influence number um, on the top, and this includes cards in your block and those vaulted. The player with the most and the second most influence on each score, each suit will score points. You know, just like card abilities, the different suits each do something different. Mm -hmm. Soldiers score you points based on how many nobles are in your block. Fisheries score you points for cards left in your hand. Nobles score you points for the coins you've collected. Clergy score points based on total influence over all cards. And builders 
score you points based on the other building types in your block. Now, after you've gone through all the professions, there's one final three-point bonus for the player who has the total highest influence adding up all their cards in their block. Now, one thing to note here, and this is something else we got wrong at first, is how vaulted cards work. These cards, except for the initial one you place face down, aren't in your block. So they do count for determining the majorities, but they don't count when actually scoring. So, for example, if you have a noble in your vault, it'll count for your having the most nobles. But you don't get the points for having a noble for your soldiers because that noble's not in your block. Yeah, and this was something else we played incorrectly during our initial plays, so it does seem worth pointing out. At this point, player with the most points wins. Well, at least that's easy to understand. <laughs> now, Aldabas also includes solar solo play, is that correct? Yeah, it does. And in this case, you're playing against an AI rival. Uh, you start by removing a bunch of coins from the deck and only play with, or sorry, a bunch of cards from the deck. They have a little symbol on them and you play with only 15 coins. Only four cards go into the market and then you kind of play your turns as normal, just as we already described. Now there is a bit of setup for the rival who will then act every round after you do. Drafting a card from the market based on this rather simple formula and then adding cards to their own tableau once they have three cards in their own supply. Now, card effects are very much simplified for the rival, and in the end, their score doesn't matter at all. All they're really doing is generating influence in the various professions so that you have something to compete against for those majorities. And when playing solo, you have to win. Second place does not score anything at all. Then, once you get to the end of the game, there's a little chart in the rules. You compare your score to see how well you did. I'm uh, telling you if you were the saver of Cartagena, if you get over 50 points, I think it is. And then there are also some ways, some dials to make it a little easier or harder if you find the AI a little too tough or a little too simple. Sounds like a solid enough solo system. The last thing now we have to cover is the new Professions expansion. I didn't get to try this myself, so how does it add to Aldibus? So the new Professions expansion adds three new card suits, each of which only has one influence level and one new ability to learn. There are bankers that let you steal coins from opponents' vaults and give endgame points for coins on cards. Merchants that give you additional coins when you get coins from the bank and give endgame scoring based on the door colors in your block. And doctors, which let you swap cards between your hand and your block or the dock. And just give a flat amount of victory points at game end. When using these new professions, you first have to swap out one of the original professions from the base game. You'll be swapping out all cards at a set influence level. That's nine of them for nine new cards. Mm -hmm. The only restriction is that you can't remove nobles or soldiers. Yeah, those ones seem to be key to the scoring of the game. There would be no reason or no way to vault anything if you start removing all the soldiers. So note, if you remove all of the, the priests, I was clergy. If you remove the clergy, there's no way to bank cards, which can change things. And honestly, that's the big thing about this expansion. It lets you adjust the gameplay in significant ways. In particular of interest to me is if you don't like backstabbing and take that elements in your games, you can pull out the cards that steal things and don't add in the new one, the new banker. Whereas if you do like that, throw both of those cards in and you're going to have a lot more stealing from each other. Now, the only thing I do recommend when playing with this expansion is don't toss in the doctors until you're playing with a group with a firm grasp of the core game, because swapping out cards really messes things up. All right, well, now that we've covered how to play Aldabas, including the solo rules and the new profession expansion, let's dive into some of our thoughts on this tableau building game. So sticking with the theme of tonight's episode, the first thing I want to call out is the theme of Aldabas. I think it's fascinating and works really well as a theme for card suits. Like it just that tied together really well. And because generally the game's pretty abstract otherwise. Most importantly, though, it taught me about something I didn't even know existed. After doing the unboxing and reading the rules for this game, I found myself Googling door knockers of Cartagena and browsing various image galleries and articles about these wondrous creations. Absolutely. I had no idea this was such a photorific place to check out and really piqued my interest as well. Now, moving from the knockers to the doors, I'm not in love with the card design here. Once you played a few games and learned what every profession does and how it works, it's not bad. But there is a lot of iconography here, and the clarity on the icons is kind of mixed. Even knowing what the cards do, I did often find myself checking the rules reference on the vault almost every game just to double check and make sure I had it right. 
I also found it strange that the most prominent thing on every card is its color. And really, the only reason that matters is for the work, the placement rules, where your cards go. Though that was changed with the expansion, because once you use the merchants, then having the most of a color actually does matter. But up to that point, I was like, why is color so prominent? Yeah, I completely agree here. And it's the one disappointment of the game for me. Things just end up being not as clear or obvious as you'd like. And it makes the learning curve tough, which we know can be a real problem for games these days. Yeah. Now, my next design complaint is the vault. I kind of mentioned this above, but I want to get into it a little bit more here because the entire vault design is just weird. You get this thin piece of card that's meant to cover up your starting card. That works, right? That's fine. You're covering one card with another card. You don't, that's, that's not a big deal. Um, but I don't see why you can't just put that card face down on the table and the vault somewhere else. Um, where the vault really falls apart, though, is once you start to put coins underneath it. Now, these wooden coins aren't thin. Like, these are thick. You probably have to stack up two or three cardboard tokens to get the same thickness. And you can't help but lift up your vault once you start putting coins in there. And if you play a really coin-heavy strategy, you basically end up with pillars holding up a roof as opposed to being something you're hiding from the other players. And similarly, if you bank a bunch of cards, it's going to do the same thing. Your stack of cards is going to lift your vault. It just, it's really awkward. Sadly, I'm not sure how else they would have done it without increasing the cost. Maybe. Yeah. The coins are the biggest problem, but all in all, it's a rather awkward solution to the vault in general. Now, what I've done is I stole some folded card vaults, literal vault, uh, pieces that stand up from another game in my collection. And we now use those every game of all the boss we play. We just place that starting block card face down and build off of that. And honestly, this works great. It's way better than stacking things under the included vault card. So I recommend if you can, finding some other solution for the vault. Yeah, so why don't we talk about difficulty? It's currently rated a 2.25 on Board Game Geek. So mid-weight-ish? Yeah, it's 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 on the heavier end of light heading towards medium, that's for sure. Um, I, I would almost say it should be higher than that, because with the number of different card abilities, various suits and higher than expected amount of iconography, it's not a simple to learn game. Now, mechanically, though, there's only three options, right? So that's pretty simple. But the various effects of cards makes the game heavier than it appears from that simple mechanic. Due to this, I actually recommend your first couple games. Don't try to win. Don't even try, just just play to find out, goof around, play some cards on your tableau and see what they do. Now, the reason I think you should do this is I think it's worth it. I honestly think that learning curve, though a little steep, it's not the worst. I've definitely played heavier games that were harder to learn, but it's just more than you would expect. But once you get through that, once you've got the icons down and most importantly learned what the various cards do and remember what suit's going to score you at the end of the game, I don't know how many times I've now played this game where someone collects all the blue and then they finish the game and they have no cards in their hand. I keep seeing players doing that. And that's obviously someone's missing something because having the most blues scores the points of your cards in your hands. Once you get past that, though, you are going to find a very engaging and I would say rewarding game. It was a push to get to the point of believing in it. But <laughs> especially with the reasonable price point and portable size, it's worth it to take a few plays and learn it. And I would also recommend everyone double check the rules, because as I mentioned, we got a couple key ones wrong that actually significantly impacted our the way of playing the game. Playing with only one action, all the bus is not what I would consider a good game. Put it up to two and it fixes all my problems. All the bus is one of those games that honestly gets better the more you play it. It's a game where you initially focus on your initial focus. We sit down to play is going to be just trying to complete your block, right? Getting stuff placed and collecting the right colors so you can actually play effectively. And just kind of getting what you get along the way. Oh, that gave me some cards. Oh, that let me steal. Neat. That'll eventually shift, though, so that you become get into card counting. When you start realizing there's only nine of every different uh, profession, and in those nine, there's three of each color. And then watching what your opponents are doing. Um, honestly, bluffing about what's in your vault. Trying to make sure you have the right amount of influence where you need it, and so on. Once you get a group of players to this level, this game really shines. And what about the expansion? Honestly, I think it's awesome. It's not that I love any of the specific professions here. It's not like, oh, I get to swap cards. I always wanted to do that. It's not that. It's the fact that I can use these with the existing ones to tweak the game to fit the people I play with. 
I game with some people that hate in-game player versus player conflict. When playing with them, I can tweak the deck to make sure there's no take that cards. Another thing I can do is to make the game quicker. I can add in all the cards that give you extra coins and coins from the bank and ways to vault those coins. Doing this makes the coin supply run out quicker, which will lead to shorter games. Plus, you can also do it the other way, where you can make it so that you add in more coins to make the game longer. And what I love about the shorter one is when games end because of coins, usually there's people who haven't finished their blocks, which just makes some really interesting scoring opportunities. I just love the fact that there are dials that I can play with to tweak my game to be a better fit for who I'm playing with. And that's what this expansion adds. So it sounds like if it is ever the case that this expansion is sold separately, it's going to be a must buy. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, if you are listening to this and you have a retail version of all the boss and that's a thing that exists, uh, do what you can to pick up this expansion because it'll let you tweak your game in interesting ways. Overall, while all the boss can be overwhelming at first, and yes, it has a learning curve, it's worth the effort to learn to play. This is a small box card game that gives a strong area majority Euro feel that's become much more enjoyable the more we've been playing. It It also features an awesome mini expansion that's great for tuning the game to better fit your game group and preferences. If you dig Euro games with majority base scoring through influence, you need to check out all the bus. It packs a ton of punch for under an hour. If you dig tableau builders that add a puzzle element in your card placement where you're trying to play cards to trigger other cards to the best effect and optimizing every play, you're going to love the gameplay in all the bus. But if you're looking for a quick, light filler card game, that's not what you're going to find here. All the bus has surprising depth and rewards game mastery and repeated plays. This is most definitely not a one and done card game to introduce to your non gamer friends who happen to like trick taking games. Well, that's it for our review of Aldabas. It's always nice to find a shorter game that still has a lot of meat to it. Mm -hmm. A filler that can satisfy games, fans of heavier games. So what's your favorite short game that still packs a lot of punch? Tell us about it in the comments below. Now, before we go, I want to invite you to check out my written review of All the Boss over at TabletopBellhop.com. There, I was able to take the time to get into more details about the various card types and what they do, something we didn't really have time for here. 